couple a couple of the general functions for digestion okay and if you think about it all right as we move through this chapter all right a lot of it you intuitively know okay so the first one is you have to put something in your mouth in order for it to be digested okay so the first all right function is going to be ingestion we're going to take some nutrients be it solid or liquid all right we're going to put it into our mouths okay yeah write that down <laughs> and so at that point now we are going to start the digestion process now there's some that argue that that process can begin even before ingestion just the thought of thinking about food all right you start to stimulate the limbic system all right and then you can actually trigger the habenular nuclei to cut on and then that starts to cause uh, uh, salivation like Pavlov's dog remember have you ever heard of those experiments give the dog a steak or show it the steak and it'll start to salivate okay so we're going to see here in ingestion this is where we start to digest and then obviously you know part of digestion is the absorption of those materials okay be it liquid or solid we want to absorb those materials into our bloodstream and lymphatic system so it can distribute it throughout our body because the cells need the nutrients there all right so in order to get stuff from the beginning of our tube to the end of our tube it needs to move so we're going to see both voluntary and involuntary muscular contractions which will occur utilizing skeletal muscle and smooth muscle okay and obviously the nervous system that's involved too to move food through the digestive system and while we're doing it we're going to mix it up because as we're mixing it we're going to be breaking it down okay this is a form of what we call catabolism all right it's a form of metabolism we start off with something big and break it down into smaller pieces okay so along the way we will have certain cells and organs which will emit or secrete fluids that will help with the digestive process some will help to secrete mucus to help maybe lubricate the digestive uh, tract others will secrete digestive enzymes and other compounds to help break down the food all right so we get to talk about that as we move through. Then we actually have the breakdown of the ingested food, all right, the solid. We break it down into smaller structures, that's the catabolism, and there's two types, okay? Mechanical digestion is the actual physical act of breaking the food down, chewing, okay? As you're chewing, there's a comedian, he says, he understands what gum is. He goes, think about it. We as humans are the only species that practices chewing food we invented gum and that's what it basically is it's just training to eat so when you're chewing you're breaking the food down and that's that mechanical breakdown of mechanical digestion the chemical digestion is now when we start to add in some of these enzymes all right and these secretions all right and we're going to start to break down literally at the molecular level chemical bonds and we'll see the role of pepsin is huge in that also like uh, hydrochloric acid in your stomach starts to break down these bonds in between all right these peptides these amino acids and they start to make them break down proteins into polypeptides and then illegal peptides and then down into the individual amino acids so we're going from something big to something smaller so we're going to start to make these big structures into smaller molecules and then i won't say finally but near the end all right We've broken these things down we have made them small enough now we have to absorb them into the bloodstream so we can redistribute everything that we've ingested all right as long as it's considered a nutrient throughout our body okay to the tissues that are in need of that and then finally whatever we don't use all right we're gonna get rid of all right and that's going to be getting rid of any components that we consider to be indigestible for example fiber we call that fiber in our diet all right and normally all right, structures or um, things that have a lot of fiber in it is going to be a plant-based structure, okay, because it has that cell. If you remember, has anyone here taken plant biology before? All right, no one's ever taken plant biology? Well, plant cells have what they call a cell wall. Our, our cells, as you know, don't have a cell wall. They have a plasma membrane. And it's the cell wall, the components of the cell wall, all right, that we can't break down, all right, or we can't break down completely. So we call it fiber. And so that's what we're going to be doing. All right, we're going to be getting rid of these indigestible components that we couldn't absorb 
and we're going to eliminate them, all right, out the other end. Okay, so in lab, we talked about, when we discussed the GI tract, that's our hollow tube, all right, and it's just going to be from start to finish. Here's the beginning, here's the end, all right? And so in this tube, we have four layers or tunics, okay? The innermost layer is the mucosa, and then the outermost layer is the adventitia or serosa, depending on where we are, okay? Certain structures, if they're within a serous membrane, then we call that outer layer the serosa, all right, representing the serosis membrane, all right, like, for example, the peritoneum inside the abdomen there, okay? All right, if it's outside, then we usually call it the adventitia, okay? So there's four layers, and we'll go through all those layers. And again, this is going to be consistent throughout the entire length of our digestive system, Okay, so when we talk about the esophagus, all right, which we talked about in lab, the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, all the way through, all right, we are going to have, all right, these four tunics there. All right, now there's always exceptions to the rule, and I'll let you know when that occurs. Okay, so the innermost layer, we've already seen this slide before, so I'm just going to kind of run through it. The innermost layer is going to contain our mucous membrane, okay? When you see mucous membrane, Okay, or even when you see the term mucosa, you should be obviously thinking of mucus production. Okay, mucus production, we need to lubricate the lumen of our digestive tract. And that's what we're going to see here. So what lines the digestive tract is going to be epithelium. Okay, now the type of epithelium will change depending on where we are. All right, but for the most part, what we're going to see, it's going to be simple columnar epithelium. And you know that simple epithelium is primarily found in places where you're going to see filtration, absorption, and secretion. Well, here's two out of the three, secretion and absorption. Makes sense. Digestive tract, we're going to absorb things. Also makes sense for secretion. All right, we're going to be secreting our digestive enzymes, and we're also going to be secreting mucus too, okay? So we're going to see all that. Now, in certain areas along the way, we are going to find our non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. That's important, all right? because we know that stratified epithelium is going to be found in places that undergo mechanical stress, all right? Non-keratinized, you should be thinking, all right, these cells are alive, but also you should be thinking that this is going to be a place where there's some moisture involved, okay? You have some wetness of some sort there, okay? So we'll see because, as you know, these digestive, especially solids, all right, when they make contact with the wall here, they can create friction and abrasive forces. So we need to have certain tissue there to withstand those forces. All right, so underneath the epithelium, we have our lamina propria. It is going to be a loose connective tissue, the areolar connective tissue. This is where we're going to see our first group of blood vessels, all right, and some of our nerves. Okay, it's important. Digestive system is heavily innervated, and we're going to have several different nerves that are going to be innervating various portions of this system. All right, you're going to have the autonomic nervous system and then what we call the enteric nervous system, and we'll talk about that later on, okay? All right, so again, here in the lamina propria, when we get to the absorption phase here, remember, our goal is to get these absorbed um, um, substances into the blood vessels, all right? And we want to get that absorption going on through those blood vessels so we can distribute it throughout the body, all right? So then deep to the lamina propria, you have this thin layer of muscle. So we call that the muscularis mucosa, okay? And I love this, all right? Because in there's some areas, and I'll point it out when we get to, the, to, to those areas. In some areas, all right, we need to move the secretions closer to the lumen, all right, of our digestive tract. And so this little thin layer, all right, will help when it contracts, it'll help to move those secretions into the lumen, all right, of the digestive tract. So those secretions can make contact with whatever those substances are going to be. And I'll show you, okay? But that's what we want to do. We want to increase the contact of those materials with the mucosa, all right? And to help to do that, the muscularis mucosa, that smooth muscle, will contract and push, all right, those secretions up into the lumen and also help to push the epithelium up against the materials of the digestive tract, increasing the surface area, increasing the digestion and the absorption area too, okay? 
All right, I love this picture here. It's a great, awesome picture. Kind of shows you what I'm talking about. Here's the lumen of our digestive tract. Okay, so the lining of our lumen is going to be this simple, all right, columnar epithelium. All right, it's going to be non-ciliated. All right, so we're going to have microvilli up there. And you know, microvilli help to increase the surface area for digestion. All right, so you'll have whatever these substances are. They'll start to be digested chemically. They've already been broken down uh, through mechanical digestion. They move through here, all right, through these cells and move into the lamina propria where we have our blood vessel and our lymphatic capillary, okay? So pretty much this is how I tell folks to remember what goes where. If it's a fat, a lipid, it's going into the lymphatic system. Easy to remember, lipid, lymphatic. Everything else goes into the blood, okay? So lipids, all right, or lipid-soluble, uh, whatever, lipid-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, are all going to head into the lymphatic capillaries, okay? Everything else, blood, okay? So that's what we're going to see at that absorption phase there through the mucosa. All right, the second layer is the submucosa, all right? This is a little bit easier here. In the submucosa, this is where we're going to see our second area, all right, of blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, and nerves, okay? But in this area, in the submucosa, we're going to have both loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue, specifically the areolar connective tissue and the dense irregular connective tissue, all right? So we're going to see our first nerve plexus here, all right? And it's this nerve plexus that is going to be responsible for triggering contraction of the smooth muscles and for the secretion of glands, okay? Well, also, remember this term here, malt, all right, the mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue, that's a secondary lymphatic structure, okay, like a lymph node, all right? But it's just random patches or grouping or clustering of lymphatic tissue, lymphatic cells, that are going to be just interspersed throughout the digestive tract. Because remember, all right, the food or the ingested material that you're taking in might not be free of bacteria, okay? E. coli, anybody? Salmonella, all right? Staph aureus, have you ever had food poisoning? Has anyone here ever had food poisoning? All right, so food poisoning is messed up, all right? And I'm telling you, if you've ever had food poisoning, all right, you know what I'm talking about, especially when you get to the projectile vomiting. You hear stories about it. But you don't know projectile vomiting until you've had it. But it's amazing because the body just wants to rid itself of whatever it is that's invaded it. So it forcefully vomits this material out to the point where you're almost turning, I feel like my stomach's turning inside out. All right? I've had it uh, pretty bad a couple times. A colleague of mine had it so bad it hospitalized him. He got so dehydrated. Point being is, all right, so we've got this, these malt structures there, and they're located all throughout all right, to kind of police, to make sure that any pathogen that manages to make it across the epithelium is going to be stopped, okay? And so I talked about this when we were talking about the immune chapter, the payer patches. And they're, they're these just huge globs of lymphatic nodules that we're going to find, all right, in the ileum and in, in the distal portion of the jejunum of the small intestine, okay? All right, the third layer, aptly named muscularis going to have some muscles there okay primarily it's going to be two layers in the stomach we have a third layer okay so we have an inner circular layer all right that's going to go around the lumen all right and then we have the longitudinal layer which is going to go the length all right of our lumen of our tube okay Okay, so when the circular layer constricts, all right, it is going to make the lumen smaller. So it goes from this size to this size. Okay, the longitudinal layer will shorten the tube. So the tube could be this long when it's relaxed, and then it could be this long when it's contracted. Okay, so depending on which layer is contracting, is going to, it depends on what type of, of um, physiological function we're undergoing. Do we want to mix things up? Most likely it's the circular layer that helps to churn things and mix it up. The longitudinal layer, when that contracts, that's for mo movement. And mo uh, when I say movement, to move something through the digestive tract, okay? Moving it proximal to distal, all right? 
So we have another nerve plexus sitting in this layer, and that's the myenteric nerve plexus. Okay? So this one here is going to help, all right, with the overall contractions of those muscle tissues there. Okay? All right, questions so far? Not too bad. Okay, good. I told you this stuff is not too bad. It's not too hard. All right. So when we talk about the enteric nervous system, think of the enteric nervous system as a local nervous system just for the digestive system, the GI tract. Okay? So we have two types of plexuses. We already talked about the submucosal plexus, and I just talked about the myenteric plexus. All right? So again, their job is going to be to um, monitor what's happening in your GI tract. If there's a stretch, let's say, all right, because you just ate something and it starts to put a stretch on the wall that the baroreceptors pick up, the, en the enteric nervous system will pick up on that, all right? Also, they'll also detect what type of chemicals are being um, in the lumen, okay? For example, all right, when we're talking about the stomach, all right, if it's empty, all right, the chemoreceptors there are kind of just chilling out, not doing anything. But now you start to take some food in and dumping food into your stomach. The chemoreceptors there, all right, are going to detect that food, all right, and then they're going to trigger some of the secretions for the gastric glands, all right, which will then trigger secretions in the small intestine too, okay? So it's made up of both sensory neurons, all right, to detect whatever the stimulus is, if it's a stretch stimulus, if it's a chemical stimulus, and then also, obviously, the motor component, contracting and relaxing those muscles so we can mix the food up or liquid, all right? And then so we can move it through the digestive tract there, okay? So in certain areas in the muscularis uh, um, layer here, we're going to have thickened areas of muscle. And we've seen this before when we talked about muscles, all right, back in Chapter 8, all right, went back in 210, two all right? We talked about sphincter muscles, all right, one of the main sphincter muscles of your mouth is the orbicularis oris, okay? So any type of sphincter muscle is going to make the lumen smaller, okay? And basically that helps to control, all right, the passage and movement of certain digested materials. All right, we're going to talk about the pyloric sphincter, for example, all right, when the stomach is going to start to empty the chyme into the small intestine. It doesn't do it all at once. It doesn't just blow it out into there. All right, it does it a little bit at a time, okay? So it doesn't overwhelm the duodenum, so we can get enough secretions in there to handle whatever it's pumping through. Plus, you got hydrochloric acid in your stomach. You don't want to be dumping all of that directly into the duodenum. You're going to start destroying tissue. That's bad, all right? We used to think that a lot of times people complained of stomach ulcers. It was because of too much of an acidic buildup in the stomach. Mm -mm. That's part of the problem. All right, the big problem is that there's a certain bacteria, H. pylori, that loves to sit and it can survive in the stomach acid, which is pretty crazy to me, but it sits in the stomach and it just starts to chew away on the epithelium there. Then it exposes the underlying tissue and then your digestive chemicals do the rest. All right, so cool stuff. Not so much if you have an ulcer though. All right, so. In this layer here, this is where we're going to see the mixing of food and the movement of food throughout the GI tract, okay? So when we talk about the mixing, all right, yes, it's going backward and forward, but it, it, talks, it doesn't have a directional movement, meaning it doesn't go, all right, necessarily towards the distal end of your GI tract. It might swish back and forth. It might go proximal, then swings distally, then proximal again. Its job is just to create movement. So you can get a mixing of the digestive, uh, I was going to say juices or sauces, but the digestive contents, the enzymes there, the chemicals, and mixing it up, all right, along with some of that mucus, all right, and churning it, or at the same time it helps to break it down a little bit. And then the other type of movement is going to be propulsion, or what we call peristalsis. All right? This is the directional movement that we're going to see. All right? This is the movement where it's going to move from the proximal portion of your digestive tract or your GI tract towards the distal end, towards the anus, going from mouth to anus, all right? And that's what we're going to see here, okay? So we call that peristalsis where we'll see a contraction followed by relaxation, followed by contraction, followed by relaxation. I've got a picture here, and I'll show you what I'm talking about, okay? 
So again, it's a sequential contraction of that layer there, okay? So on the right here, or excuse me, on the left, you can see what, what the mixing is. So we see, all right, contraction then relaxation, and sometimes it moves to the right of our page, and sometimes it moves to the left of our page. It just kind of sloshes it around, all right? While the whole time it's churning it and mixing it. When we're talking about propulsion here, all right, peristalsis, all right, we get a wave of contraction behind all right, the digested material. In front of it, it's relaxed. All right, so it's relaxed here. As it contracts, it pushes it. All right, you can see it keeps pushing it in one direction. That's what we're talking about, okay? So one type of contraction will cause the mixing, and the other type of contraction is going to cause the propulsion, that directional movement there. All right, finally, the last layer here is the adventitia, adventitia excuse me, or the serosa. All right, now again, it depends on where that organ is located, okay? If it's what we call intraperitoneal, then we're gonna call it serosa, all right? If it's outside of the peritoneum, then we assign adventitia, okay? They're relatively similar, okay? The adventitia is gonna be an areolar connective tissue outside of that peritoneal cavity there, okay? And, you know, initially I would, I, I, I would say retroperitoneal, but it doesn't necessarily have to be retroperitoneal. It doesn't have to be behind the peritoneum. It could be off to the side. Right? It's just outside of that cavity, right? Because remember, the peritoneum is a cavity in the abdominal pelvic um, cavity in your body, all right? And it's lined by a serous membrane, okay? Remember, serous membranes, two layers, okay? You have the parietal and the visceral. The parietal layer is going to be the layer that covers the internal uh, uh, lining of the abdominal cavity. And then the visceral layer is going to directly line the organs themselves. Okay. So the serosa here, again, it's going to be covered with that second layer, that visceral peritoneum. All right. So it's going to be found within the peritoneal cavity, whereas the adventitia will be outside. For example, the duodenum. The duodenum is considered to be a retroperitoneal organ, so it lies outside, which is the first part, all right, the first part of your small intestine. It is not in the peritoneum, okay? Parts of the large intestine, same thing. The ascending and descending uh, colon are outside of the peritoneum. All right, so we saw this picture in lab. Just kind of showing you again keep in mind when you're thinking the digestive system it's a tube and some of those tubes all right or certain areas of the digestive system the tube is bigger and sometimes it's smaller all right and then you've got certain parts of it like the stomach for example it's part of that tube but it's got like some irregular bulges going on all right but it's still part of that tube nonetheless all right it's like a holding center or a holding bag okay so keep that in mind one long tube from mouth to anus. All right, so I do wanna talk about how we regulate the digestive system a little bit. In order to do that, I have to talk about the control center, all right? And the primary control center here, all right, for our digestive system is gonna be the nervous system, okay? Remember I said there's two parts to it. You've got your autonomic nervous system. That's the easiest one to go over first, all right? So you got your parasympathetic and your sympathetic. What's the nickname for parasympathetic? What do we say? Or what's the nickname for sympathetic? Fight or flight. And parasympathetic is? Rest and digest. Okay? So the parasympathetic is going to promote GI tract activity. Increase motility, um, help to increase uh, um, secretion, glandular secretion. All right, that's cool. I like that. Whereas the sympathetic is going to do the opposite. It's going to oppose the GI tract activity. Okay? It's going to decrease motility, decrease secretions. All right, that's good. You don't really need to be digesting your Burger King if you're gonna run a marathon. So we're gonna shut down the digestive system a little bit, all right, if we're gonna be engaging in some uh, activity or exercise, okay? So the enteric, all right, which involves, again, our submucosal plexus and the myenteric plexus, has both a sensory and motor component to it, all right, 
but its job is to innervate the smooth muscle of the digestive system and the glands. So think smooth muscle, movement, okay, and then glands, secretion, secretion of some stuff, okay? So it's going to coordinate our mixing, and then it's also going to coordinate propulsion, the movement through the digestive tract. Okay, it's got a pretty good role there. It lives a pretty decent life. Okay, so that's the enteric nervous system. So, oh, I can't remember which chapter it was. I think it's chapter 14 when you were learning about the spinal cord and the reflexes. Okay, and there's certain components to a reflex that you had to learn when we were talking about like the withdrawal reflex, for example. You needed a stimulus, then you needed a receptor to monitor that stimulus, then you had the sensory component that sent that sensory in input that the stimulus caused, all right, to the control center, the central nervous system, or the spinal cord, and then the spinal cord was going to determine what type of uh, response it was going to elicit, and it would send that information through the motor or output area down to the effector organ. And if it was a, a muscle withdrawal reflex, it would just contract the skeletal muscle. We're going to see all right, a very similar type of pattern here when we talk about all right, the reflexes here of the digestive system. So if you kind of know all right, what that, that kind of pattern, that cycle, you're going to be good here. Okay? So we're going to have a stimulus, okay? for example. We talked about it in lab, lab uh, what's today? Wednesday, on, on Monday, all right? When you start to take food in to your stomach, your stomach starts to increase secretion production and contractions because the stomach's going to start to mix those things, all right? The baroreceptors, which are the stretch receptors in the stomach wall, detected the stretch, all right? And they started then to elicit some sort of response. So that's what we're going to see here. We're going to have receptors both baroreceptors and chemoreceptors, okay? One's for stretch, the other one's for some sort of chemical activity going on or the presence of a specific type of chemical, all right? Depending on what's in the lumen, all right? And then that's gonna stimulate either the anti anterior, the autonomic nervous system or the enteric nervous system, okay? And then those nervous systems, all right, are going to then elicit some sort of effect. All right, through, and it's pretty simple, an effector organ. Well, we already know what effector organs are, y'all. Muscles and glands, muscles and glands, okay? So this is homeostasis all over again. Receptor, control center, effector, all right? So that's what we're going to see here. So we have two types of reflexes here. We got the short and the long reflex, okay? The short reflex is only going to involve the enteric nervous system, okay? Only which is cool. We don't need to bother the autonomic nervous system with this, right? So this is only going to be found at a very local level in, in small parts of the GI tract. Now, when we're talking about the long reflex, now we're going to involve the central nervous system, mainly the autonomic motor portion of it, okay? And so this is going to be a whole bunch of different things, all right? We've got to affect the motility of the GI tract, okay? Then we've got to get some glands to secrete, and then we might even have to get some of the digestive accessory organs involved, pancreas, all right? The liver, liver makes bile, pancreas makes amylase and lipase, all right? Gallbladder, okay? So think of the long reflex as, as a more broader type, all right, a more broader type of involvement, all right? Our short reflex is gonna be very local, Okay, small segments of the GI tract. Okay, so remember, control center, nervous system. What's another control center? Endocrine system. Okay, so we are going to involve, all right, some hormones here. And you can see a couple listed here. We'll go through all of these here. All right, but some of these hormones, you know, hormones are chemical messengers. All right, and what are they going to do? They're going to stimulate or inhibit a target cell. That's it. That's what these hormones are going to do, depending on what their activity is, okay? Gastrin secretin, we saw that secretin is going to help to increase the motility, all right, of, of secretions in the stomach and the secretion of the glands in the stomach. We'll get through all these, okay? All right. 
So we're going to start kind of uh, going over a couple of the uh, of the structures here in the um, in the peritoneum, uh, the in the in the GI tract. So I just want to run through a couple of these anatomical structures here briefly because I've already talked about them. All right, the peritoneum. Remember that's the serous membrane. It's in the abdominal pelvic cavity. All right, the parietal peritoneum. All right, that's going to line the inside surface of the abdominal pelvic wall. All right, the visceral is going to be on top of the organ surface. Now, in between those two layers, we have a cavity, okay, the peritoneal cavity. It is a potential space. But in that potential space, you get a secretion, all right, for lubrication, so the organs can slide past each other nicely, okay? Surgeons rely on this greatly when they're going in through your bowels and trying to locate certain things or move things out of the way. If it wasn't for this, your, your guts would be pretty much fixed in one location. All right, they're supposed to be somewhat fixed, but think about it. They're always changing depending on what is moving through the lumen there, okay? So we're gonna see, all right, in the peritoneal cavity, all right, that lubrication will allow, all right, the uh, organs to move freely by one another. All right, so you heard me talk about intraperitoneal organs and the retroperitoneal organs, all right? Intraperitoneal, all right, they are going to be in, uh, they're gonna be covered or inside the peritoneum, all right, the visceral peritoneum, okay? Stomach, most of the small intestine, duodenum is retroperitoneal, all right? Parts of the large intestine, for example, the cecum, the transverse colon, those will be intraperitoneal. The sigmoid colon is also intraperitoneal, okay? Retroperitoneal, retro means behind. So these guys are gonna sit directly on top of the posterior abdominal wall. Perfect example, your kidneys. Your kidneys are retroperitoneal organs, okay? And so will some of these other organs that you can see here. The duodenum, the pancreas, ascending, descending colon, and the rectum. Those are all retroperitoneal structures, all right? So parts of these organs, all right, will be seen on the front and the side, okay? And the front and the side are usually going to be covered, all right, by the peritoneum. If it's not, all right, then it's outside of the peritoneum. So that's usually retro, retroperitoneal, all right? But when you say retroperitoneal, you think that they are against the posterior abdominal wall. It's hard to appreciate this when you don't actually have a cadaver to look at, all right? And most of the time when you're dissecting this region of the cadaver, all right, everything is usually dissected cadaver on its back, so gravity is always pulling everything against the abdominal cavity, uh, against the posterior wall, so it's tough to see, all right? But this here kind of shows us, all right, some of our organs here. Here is the liver, the stomach is over here. Remember, we have this, um, serous membrane, what we call, the, well, the mesentery and the omentum here, which is part of, all right, this covering that hangs off. We also, the greater omentum, we call that the fatty apron. And it has tons of adipose tissue that accumulates on here. And it moves around, all right, in certain situations, for example, if you get, so, and we're going to talk about peritonitis here, you get inflammation, all right, in the peritoneum, the greater omentum, can move over to where that area is, and it can help to, uh, I'm not gonna say cure it, but it helps to treat it. All right, and I'll talk to, talk to you about that in a second here. All right, so when we're talking about the serous membrane, parts of the serous membrane have extensions, all right, we call those mesentery. For example, the falciform ligament, when we were talking about the liver, all right, uh, in the lab on Monday here, okay, this is this ligament that comes off anteriorly off of the liver and it attaches to the anterior abdominal wall, right? It helps to hold the liver onto the front of the abdominal wall. I'll show you a picture of that um, probably next week when we get into, uh, the, well, I might, did I show you the guys the liver in, in lab on Monday? Do you remember? No, I didn't. I showed you part of it. I'll, I'll go over it again. All right. Then we got the mesentery proper. All right, now the mesentery proper is this huge fan-shaped tissue that pretty much holds onto, if you were to um, 
take the small intestine and spread it out. The mesentery proper, all right, binds onto, all right, all of the of the small intestine, and it anchors it onto the posterior abdominal wall. Okay, so the the small intestine has a has some limited movement as it should. Okay, because remember, all right, its structure is constantly changing depending on what's going on digestively. Okay, but this mesentery proper helps to hold all right, that small intestine all right, into the abdominal cavity by anchoring it to the posterior abdominal wall. The mesocolon, again, that's just part of the peritoneum that is going to attach onto the large intestine here and also help to attach to the posterior abdominal wall. Okay? So these mesentery structures, again, help to provide order so things aren't just sliding around in your abdominal cavity there. Okay? It's good to have some separation here between the structures. Oh, I totally skipped this. I'm sorry, guys. All right, in case you were wondering what the heck mesentery was, it's like, wait a minute, I thought I was going to... All right, it's our double layer of peritoneum there. That's what we call it. But it also, when it, when it attaches onto certain intraperitoneal organs, all right, we give it a specific name. Like, all right, the, the mesico... The, uh, the, the uh, mesocolon, okay? That's the mesentery that attaches onto parts of the large um, intestine there, okay? All right, in the mesentery, we're going to see tons, and I mean tons, of blood, lymphatic vessels, and nerves there, okay? So the greater momentum is that big, large, here's your stomach here, all right, and the, and the greater momentum is like this big, huge, fatty apron that hangs off, all right? And it's just loaded with tons of adipose tissue. Then the lesser momentum, we're going to find that between the liver and the uh, uh, stomach. That's going to be in the what we call the, the lesser curvature of the stomach, all right? All right, peritonitis. Inflammation of the peritoneum, okay? Patient complains of abdominal pain. They can have a fever, all right? Usually, this is what, when we, we'll see this when somebody has, all right, a, a perfect perforation of the bowel, okay? They get a hole, all right? It could be an internal cause or an external cause, all right? They get stabbed, for example, all right? And it pierces into the GI tract, all right? That's going to be an external perforation, right? They have an ulcer or something from the inside that bur I won't say burrows out. It's to imply that there's something in there, all right? But if it were to uh, poke a hole, all right, through the inside out, again, it's going to cause, and you probably know this, that you have what we call normal bacteria flora. There's certain type you've heard of good bacteria. People take probiotics all the time because they want to promote this normal population of bacteria because it helps with the digestion of food, right? But unfortunately, it's, it's in a controlled area, in the large intestine, for example. If it gets out, right, and it starts wandering around through the peritoneum, then it turns into what we call an opportunistic organism, right? And it can cause, all right, bacterial infection and then therefore initiate the immune response, and we can have all sorts of problems. All right, I want to start at the beginning, up in the mouth, all right, and we're going to work our way down to our stomach, our small intestine, all right. We'll try to get to the stomach today, okay. So when we're dealing with, all right, the upper GI tract, and the upper GI tract is pretty much all the way from the mouth to the pharynx, to the esophagus, to the stomach, to the duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, okay? That's going to be the upper GI tract, all right? And then we're going to include what we call our accessory structures, like the teeth, for example, all right? We'll get into all that. Okay, oral cavity and the salivary glands, we've already talked about this, but this is where we start our mechanical digestion, okay? Chewing the food up, breaking it down. The salivary glands are going to start secreting saliva. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to happen, like I said before, all right, when you put something in your mouth during ingestion. 
you can just start thinking about something and you can start to produce saliva. Okay. Think of gummy bears. Oh, well, yeah. True. I do like to eat. There's two types of people in this world. Well, it depends on what classification system you use. If you read Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, there's classics and romantics, but there's also those that live to eat and then those that eat to live. I'm one of those people that eats to live. I like food. I don't love it. There's certain types of food, but I, ha I married somebody and she loves to eat. She just loves food, you know, which is kind of good for me because I've eaten some pretty good stuff. Like I had some great Guinness beef stew last night. And I'm trying to think what I'm going to have tonight. Oh, has anyone ever had chimichurro sauce? I love chimichurro sauce. I can't have it on my eggs in the morning because it would give me garlic breath. But otherwise, I'd be putting it on my eggs every morning. All right. So here, all right, we start to see salivation of amylase. And amylase is going to be what starts the breakdown of starch. Now, starch is a very complex, I guess I didn't need to use very, all right, it's a complex carbohydrate, okay? So with starch, it takes a lot to start to break it down. So we're lucky that we have the salivary amylase that starts to break these starches down in the mouth, okay, during this. And also, <laughs> In the oral cavity, this is where we start to see, where we start to mix up, all right, the food stuff, all right, and liquid stuff that we put in our mouth with the saliva, all right? So once we start to chew on stuff and form this structure, I guess, this thing in our mouth, we call that a bolus, okay? Bolus is, a, is an actual combination of food, liquid, saliva. It's all just being mixed up in there, okay? The next region, all right, of the upper GI tract is the pharynx. Remember, there's three parts. We have the nasal pharynx, all right, that's the part up by the nose, all right. Then we have the oral pharynx, that's the part of the pharynx right behind the oral cavity, and then we have the laryngeal pharynx, that's the part of the pharynx down by the larynx, so the voice box, okay. So after that bolus is moved out of the oral cavity, it moves into the pharynx, and this is where we start to have that swallowing. Okay, as we start to move the food into the back posterior portion of the oral cavity, we're going to start to initiate swallowing here. Okay, so prior to that, all right, we have mucus producing cells, goblet cells all over the place, right, amongst other types of cells that are producing mucus to lubricate the pharynx for the process of swallowing. Okay. Then we go from the pharynx into the esophagus. We all know that the esophagus is that tube that connects the pharynx down to the stomach. Also has plenty of cells to produce mucus, again, for lubrication. Then finally, the bolus lands into the stomach, which is that pouch, that holding pouch there, okay? And it moves down into the stomach through muscular contractions in the esophagus, all right? That, um, caused by the smooth muscle, right, enters into the stomach, all right, where we start to have, all right, the process of gastric secretions occurring. So we're going to start to dump out some more enzymes, hydrochloric acid, a couple other types of chemicals into the stomach, and we're going to start to mix up the bolus with these gastric secretions, and then we're going to form what we call chyme. Okay, so the chyme is our digested food products there. And then the stomach is going to um, emit, all right, that chyme into the duodenum. Okay, so that's all part of the upper GI tract. That's it in, in, in an overall view, okay? So when we talk about the oral cavity here, all right, we have two areas. Again, we've already seen this in lab, so again, I'm going to kind of move through this, just a quick review. All right, our oral cavity has two regions. The vestibule, that's the space in between your teeth and your gums and your lips and the cheeks there, all right? And then you have the oral cavity proper. That's behind the teeth, all right, just in front of the, the oral pharynx there, okay? So in our oral cavity proper here, all right, this is where we're going to find the bolus getting pushed back to enter into the oral pharynx. Don't forget about the role, the important role of the buccinator muscle, okay? 
This is the muscle that helps to contract to hold your cheeks flush or close to your teeth so food doesn't fall out of the oral cavity, all right, and into the vestibule. It stays over your teeth or in the oral cavity here, okay? All right, your lips pretty much are going to be made up of the orbicularis oris muscle, all right? They are made, all right, of uh, stratified epithelium, okay? Your squamous epithelium there, right? Again, most of the time when we've seen, we've talked about this before, if something has a reddish hue to it, it's usually because of the blood vessels there. So your lips have a significant amount of blood vessels located in there, all right? Still has keratin, but just a decreased amount there, all right? And you've noticed in the, where both the lips, both sides of your lips meet in the front, on the top, and on the bottom, all right, your superior and inferior labia, all right, where they meet, all right, they're attached, all right, to the mucosa here by this labial frenulum here. So if I show you in this picture, you probably remember this from lab, all right. Here's the superior labial frenulum. Here's the inferior labial frenulum, all right. So that just a little bit of tissue that's going to hold the lips there, all right, close to, whoops, where am I going? All right, close to the, to the alveolar processes, okay? All right, so the roof of your mouth is known as the palate, all right? You've got a hard and soft palate, okay? The anterior two-thirds of the roof of your mouth is going to be the hard palate. It's going to be made up of primarily the maxillary bone, okay? That's the anterior two-thirds of the hard palate. And then the posterior one-third of the hard palate is going to be made up of the horizontal plates of the palatine bone. Okay, that's going to make up the roof of your mouth. And then behind the hard palate, you'll have the soft palate. And hanging down from the soft palate, you're going to have the uvula there. Okay, so this is where we're going to, and it's important, all right, because the, the palate here, all right, plays, especially the soft palate, plays a huge role during the swallowing process because the soft palate and the uvula get elevated to close off the nasal pharynx there so you don't regurgitate any um, um, material up into your nasal cavity, which is not a good thing, okay? So in the front of your oral cavity, just behind the teeth, all right, and on the anterior one-third portion of your hard palate, you've got the transverse palatine uh, folds here, okay? Again, your tongue will use that area, those rough folds, to help manipulate food as it's starting to form the bolus, okay? Your tongue also has the papillae, those little bumps on the tongue. Some of those papillae are filled with taste buds, all right? And, but most of them are not, especially the, the, the majority of the papillae on the anterior portion of your tongue. It's primarily there just to manipulate food and move it around there, okay? The uvula here, again, that's going to be that kind of that cone-like projection that hangs down from the posterior portion of your soft palate there, okay? Has anyone ever had to go to their doctor and their doctor do the gag reflex on them? Where they stick like a tongue depressor and they jam it into your back of your throat and you gag? Well, they usually are aiming for the uvula, all right? Um, and if, you don't have to go that far. <laughs> you, no, you don't. Like, I know that some people, when they brush their teeth, they'll brush their tongue at the end of it. And they'll, if they go back too far in the posterior uh, uh, portion of the tongue, they can elicit a gag reflex. Pardon? Everyone. Every, yeah, you should. I think you should. You should scrub your tongue. They have a, actually have a tool. It looks like a, a U-shaped thing, uh, and you can use it to scrape your tongue. A lot of people do it. It's, well, it's disgusting. <laughs> that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. They're really cool. It works a lot better than U-shaped. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I saw one over at, I think it was CVS or whatever. So a friend of mine had one, and I was in their bathroom once, and I said, what the heck is that thing? It was hanging right by their toothbrush. And they said, oh, you do this. And they showed me how to use it. And I was like, all right. I was like, I'll just use the toothbrush. I'm lazy. All right. Oral cavity, finally, near the posterior portion of the oral cavity, as we move into the oral pharynx here, all right, we have, all right, this opening portion, we call those aphauses. We saw um, some aphauses up there by the nasal cavity as we move from the nasal cavity into the nasal pharynx. Well, we have one here in the oral cavities. We go into the oral pharynx, all right? But in this situation, 
you've got two folds of muscle, okay? The more anterior is called the palatoglossal arch, all right? Underneath that is the palatoglossus muscle. And then posterior to that is the palatopharyngeal arch, okay? And that's going to um, cover the, or underneath that is going to be the palatopharyngeal muscle. Both are innervated by the, the vagus nerve. And this is what you do when you actually do the gag reflex, all right? A reflex usually tests a sensory component and a motor component. So when we do uh, this type of reflex, the gag reflex, we're testing your cranial nerve number nine, glossal pharyngeal, all right? And we're testing the motor aspect, the vagus nerve, because the vagus nerve will elevate your soft palate. Okay, well, in between these two arches, we have, all right, some more secondary lymphatic structures. Our palatine tonsils are there, all right? So this is where we're going to start to see, all right, part of the innate immune system kicking in, all right, with when we're dealing with the mucosal membrane, with what type of antibodies live in, in mucus? IgA, all the way. All right, number one in the alphabet, number one uh, kicking butt against, uh, you know, foreign antigens, all right, because it's right there. I know. I've tried. I've messed around. Yeah, I've tried many different ways. I, I think the best way, I'm trying to remember, I tried to learn which one gets produced first. It's just there's no really good way. All right, then dealing with the tongue, okay. Does anyone remember what cranial nerve innervates the tongue? Close, 12, hypoglossal, hypoglossal nerve, okay? So the hypoglossal nerve is going to innervate the extrinsic and intrinsic muscles, all right? Pretty much skeletal muscles here on the tongue. We see those bumps there, all right? Some of those bumps have taste buds, so the tongue, tongue is involved in taste, okay? On the back side, not the, well, on the posterior portion, but uh, on the lateral underneath portion of the tongue, we have our lingual tonsils. Again, that's some more lymphatic tissues there. The base of the tongue is anchored to the floor, right, of the oral cavity through the lingual frenulum, right? But its main job is to help manipulate and mix food while you're chewing and also to help with speech as you're talking. And it also to help move back food during the swallowing process there. So here you can see here on our uh, um, figure here, here's the lingual frenulum, helps to anchor the tongue to the base of the oral cavity there. Looking at it from the lateral side here, all right, <clears throat> here's the hard palate, soft palate's right behind it. You've got the nasal pharynx above the soft palate, the oral pharynx here, all right, in the posterior portion of the oral cavity. And then we got our laryngeal pharynx down here with the esophagus in the posterior back region here. Okay. All right, let's talk about the glands real quick here. Okay, a couple of our salivary glands. All right, the most numerous here are going to be the intrinsic salivary glands. Those are single cell glands, all right, which just cause overall moisture of the mouth. Okay. And, they're, and it, it, they work regardless, or hopefully they work, regardless of food or liquid, okay? So they're always working. But they do produce, all right, this lingual lipase here. All right, lipase helps with the digestion of, take a guess, take a guess. Lipids. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool, cool, cool. All right, now, the extrinsic salivary glands. These are the three named glands. All right, the submandibular gland, sublingual gland, and the parotid gland. All right, these are the guys that are going to make most of the saliva, all right, when you are actually going to be um, undergoing the process of digestion, okay? So when we start to secrete, all right, our productions for saliva, all right, these three glands are going to be doing most of the heavy lifting. Now, the parotid gland is the largest. This is the one that's located directly in front of your ear, okay? anterior to the ear, posterior to the masseter muscle of the ramus of the jaw, okay? It's the largest. This is the one that um, if you get an infection of it, mumps, okay? And it has a duct that crosses right over in front of the masseter muscle, and it heads towards your second molar. And it's going to dump its product 
about 25, 30%, all right, of overall uh, saliva production is made by this gland here, okay? So mandibular glands, these guys make the most, okay? They're the ones that are going to be on the floor of the oral cavity, all right, where we right by the body of the mandible. Remember, your mandible has the ramus here, and then the body goes in the front. All right, and here are the teeth. All right, so the submandibular gland is going to be, all right, just on the inside here of the body of the mandible here, okay? And so you'll see there are several small submandibular ducts that open up onto the floor of the oral cavity, okay? Sublingual gland is going to be just in front of the submandibular gland, all right, and it does not make that much saliva. It's about three to five percent, all right, and it has these tiny ducts here, all right, that open up onto the undersurface or inferior surface. I misspoke. The, I'm just confusing the submandibular duct with the sublingual, okay? All right, cool. Questions so far? How about this interesting fact? Look how much saliva you produce in a day. One to 1.5 liters of saliva. Now, I used to wrestle, and one of the things that I had to do when I wrestled was cut weight. And so wrestlers are not the smartest people. And so, pardon? Spitting bottles. Yeah, we spit in bottles. Uh, especially when I was lying in bed at night trying to go to sleep. I figured if I'd spit, but I never spit half of this amount. All right. Anyways, um, if you look here, the majority of saliva is water. Okay. But what I also find interesting is this right here, lysozyme, antimicrobial. So have you ever, you don't have to answer this. Okay. But there may have been a time where you cut yourself and you went and licked your wound. All right. Now you might be like, oh, that's stupid. All right, but you thought, all right, possibly. And if you didn't, okay. But that's an instinctual thing. You see animals do it all the time because when they lick their wounds, they're cleaning their wounds. It's because of the antimicrobial, all right, uh, enzyme in there that helps to clean the wounds. Well, guess what? You produce it too, okay? So same thing. Now ours is different. Our lysozyme here is more so if you ingest any bacteria, all right, or any pathogens that helps to take that out, all right? But it's not really meant for you when you get a cut and start sucking on it, okay? But saliva, obviously, it's going to help to make an enzyme, the amylase again, that's, that's that uh, um, enzyme that helps to break down the starch, but also mucin, okay? Again, mucin will create mucus when mixed with water, which will create lubrication, okay? So when we do all this and the saliva gets formed, we mix that saliva into the food to form the bolus, all right? And during that time, we start to break down our starch, okay? Tim, is this true? Cleanses oral cavity structures? Is it, how effective would you say? Oh, all right, because right, I was going to stop brushing when I read that. But all right, all right, I won't do that then. All right, no. All right, I've heard that too, um, that it does help to clean some of the, the, the cavity structures there. All right, also, all right, we'll see our IgAs, okay, because we're going to be dealing with the mucous membranes there. Anytime you have mucous membranes, you are going to have IgA antibodies there, okay? That's what gets produced. That's where they are, okay? All right, so... How do we regulate this? Again, everything, for the most part, that we've seen this semester when we talk about regulation for certain processes in our bodies, respiratory, cardiac, all occurs in the brainstem. So the, saliva, the salivary glands are no different. Okay? They're going to be stimulated all right, by nuclei in the brainstem. Okay? Now... I just went over this with my 210 class, and I'm going to refresh you folks, okay? Parasympathetic nervous division, all right? We call that the cranial sacral division. It's another name for it, which means there's four cranial nerves, all right, 
that are part of the parasympathetic nervous system. Does anybody remember the four? I'm not terribly upset, but you will remember them now. Three, seven, nine, and 10. Three is oculomotor, motor, eye movements, okay? Vasoconstriction, excuse me, excuse me. Pupillary constriction, pupillary dilation, okay? Uh, for cranial nerve three, three. Okay, cranial nerve number seven is facial. Facial is going to stimulate, all right, your salivary glands. Nine, same thing. So seven and nine are the two cranial nerves that are going to be responsible, all right, for salivation. Okay, so that's what this is talking about. Basal level of salivation in response to parasympathetic stimulation. Mainly seven, facial, and nine, glossopharyngeal. Okay, so we'll see. Again, it's all based on, remember, these are all reflexes, y'all, reflexes. So we have receptors in the oral cavity, all right, that are going to start to detect, all right, certain stimuli. Well, what's a stimuli? Food, liquid, okay? And it's going to start to stimulate effectors, all right, throughout different portions of the digestive system. So when you start to chew on something, all right, that sensory information is going to go to the digestive regions of your brainstem, which will then start to stimulate stomach secretions to occur. Stomach motility will increase to prepare the stomach for whatever it is you're drinking or eating. All right? So again, it's all reflexes here. Okay? So this information is going to get sent to the brainstem. And when we talk about signals also received from the higher brain centers, we're talking about the limbic system mostly, all right? The hypothalamus is, is another area there, all right? Just the conscious thought of food in some people. We talked about this. You can start to water. Your mouth can start to water. You smell something, all right? That's temporal lobe, olfactory. You start to smell something, mm, okay, all right? You taste something, insula, all right? So my point being is, all right, you don't actually have to have the presence of something in your mouth. So when we talk about signals received from the higher brain centers, that can also start to stimulate salivary production there, all right? Or direct stimulation for the parasympathetic nervous system, okay? All right. We've seen that picture, seen that picture. All right. So chewing, mastication. Remember what the most powerful muscle of mastication is? Masseter, that's right. Masseter, innervated by glossal, excuse me, that's a lie, trigeminal, okay, trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve number five, all right? So when we talk about mastication, we're literally talking about chewing, mechanical breakdown, all right? We're going to take something big, chew on it, break it down, all right? As that's occurring, the, the receptors in the mouth, all right, are going to start to be triggered, all right, to release saliva if they haven't been already, okay? We mix that saliva in. All right, and then as that's occurring, now we can actually start to swallow this food down, all right? But when we talk about actual mastication, all right, the coordinated activities of all of these structures, think about it. Do you actually honestly feel like you have to think when you're chewing food other than open mouth, closed mouth, open mouth, closed mouth? I mean, do you actually consciously know what your tongue is doing? I bet you tonight when you go home, if you have something to eat, you're going to think, well, man, I don't even, my tongue's over here, now it's over here, you know? Your buccinator muscles contract and relax, you know, without your conscious thought. Thank goodness, all of that occurs at the mastication center, right? Yeah, it's involving skeletal muscles, right? Not all, skeletal muscles, you know, when we're dealing with reflexes, aren't always under voluntary control 100% of the time, okay? So these mastication centers are, or centers, center are great to kind of coordinate. What a pain in the butt that would be if you had to think of every little thing when it came to chewing something. It would suck. Right, well, yeah, sure. Usually pain usually helps with that. All right. So when we talk about, well, we already talked about the teeth. I didn't get a chance to mention this part of the teeth, though. I did want to talk about the teeth here. Well, I hate to do this. Quick anatomical review of the teeth. All right. The exposed portion of the tooth that you see when you're smiling for a picture is the crown. All right. 
Then it sits on top of the neck, just like the head of a, a, a of, a, of the bone will sit on top of the neck there. All right, the neck is usually sur it's surrounded by the gums, hopefully, as long as you don't have a receding gum line. All right, and then from the neck all the way down into the jaw, we have our roots. Okay, and so where the this uh, the, the tooth, all right, when it, for it forms a joint with either the maxilla or the mandible, all right, we call that a gomphosis. And those little socket-like joints where they sit in are the dental alveoli. And what connects the dental, the actual tooth to, all right, the actual bone of the jaw and the maxilla are the periodontal ligaments. These little tiny ligaments here, you can see, here they are. These are the periodontal ligaments. And they hold the tooth, supposedly, hopefully, in place. Right, and prevent it from really moving around. So here you can see, here's the crown, that's the exposed part, okay? And so that exposed part is known as, the, the actual tissue is enamel. Enamel is the strongest substance in the body, all right? Just deep to that, all right, is the dentin. Guess what? Dentin's stronger than bone. That's pretty cool, as long as it's healthy. All right, and then deep to the dentin in the center here, we've got our pulp cavity, blood vessels and pulp located here, and then our roots, all right, we'll still have blood vessels in the roots here in that root canal. I've never had a root canal, and I hope I never do. I hear they're awful. Yeah, I hear they're awful. I got issues with teeth, so. All right. Pardon? Not that bad. No, but, yeah. Really? Mm. Really? I'd love to see it, but I think I have to be knocked out. You'll have to sedate me. When I went to get my wisdom teeth pulled, my doctor was like, here, take these, watch this. And he's just sitting there holding my fins and just watching my teeth. I can't even go outside. Yeah. I know that some of you haven't had me before. Um, but I actually was asked to extract a wisdom tooth. I think I told you guys that. I'm going to skip that. I'm, ah, I'm starting to, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Repeat myself. I'm sounding like my father. All right, no, that's a bad thing. All right. <laughs> Let's just uh, talk a few minutes here about the esophagus and the pharynx here. Um, I didn't get to make it as far as I wanted to, but that's okay. All right. Um, You've seen a couple of these slides already, so no worries, all right? When we're talking about the, the, the pharynx, all right, that's that funnel-shaped structure, okay, that's going to accommodate the passage of food and air, all right? Pretty much the nasal pharynx should just be air, but the oral pharynx and the laryngeal pharynx, all right, that's going to accommodate both food and air, okay? It's surrounded by skeletal muscles, or we call those the pharyngeal constrictors. You have superior pharyngeal constrictor, middle pharyngeal constrictor, and inferior pharyngeal constrictor. But it is lined with non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Why? Mechanical stress, abrasions, all right? The bolus, the food, is going to roll into that area, and so it's going to cause a lot of scraping. So we want to protect against that abrasion there, okay? All right, so... When we talk about the esophagus, all right, the pharynx leads into the esophagus, okay? And think of the esophagus as a muscular tube that connects the pharynx to the stomach, okay? When there's nothing going through it, okay, when there's nothing going through it, all right, it's collapsed. And at the top, you've got a sphincter, okay, up here, and that's closed when nothing's going through it. And at the bottom, you have another sphincter. And when nothing is going through it, that's closed. Okay, so it is going to be normally collapsed. It sits posterior to the trachea, but anterior or in front of the vertebral bodies here. Okay, then it passes through the diaphragm, through the, one of the three holes in the diaphragm, the esophageal hiatus, and then it enters into the stomach. Okay, so here's that tube, with the, or the sphincter at the top, the superior esophageal sphincter, right? 
This is closed when you're not swallowing anything, and it's closed to prevent air from going into your stomach. Okay? Same thing here with the inferior esophageal sphincter. It is also closed, all right, when you're not using it. All right? And it's going to prevent things from leaving the stomach with the help of the muscles of the diaphragm. Okay? All right, so here we can see it. All right, here's the esophagus, all right? At the inferior portion of the pharynx, the laryngeal pharynx, all right? We have the superior esophageal sphincter, and then it travels all the way down, all right? Midline here, pierces through the diaphragm, through the esophageal hiatus, and then enters into the stomach here, okay? And just before it enters into the stomach, we have the inferior esophageal sphincter, which is also closed, which prevents the entry or exiting uh, of any um, food product. All right, so the lining of the esophagus is non-keratinized stratified simple squamous, excuse me, stratified squamous epithelium. Makes sense, all right? Abrasion, mechanical stresses, we get that now, okay? All right, so that's going to be in the mucosal layer. The submucosal layer, all right, is where we're going to see normally, all right, a lot of blood vessels. But in this case, we're going to see tons of elastic fibers, okay? Talked about this in lab allows for this for the esophagus to get stretched out a little bit all right we will also see a lot of mucus secreting glands in that region all right to lubricate the esophagus okay in our third layer all right in the muscularis layer here we're going to see a combination of skeletal muscle and smooth muscle thing is at the superior portion here all right the superior one third is skeletal muscle at the inferior one-third, it's smooth muscle. And in the middle, it's a mixture of both. Okay? So as we inferiorly travel down the esophagus, we're going to see that transition of skeletal muscle to smooth muscle. Okay? And in this case, the outermost layer, we refer to it as the adventitia because it is in the thorax. So we're not going to call it the serosa because it's not part of the peritoneum. All right, motility, all right, swallowing, deglutination, okay? This is the three phases that I was telling you about, all right? When we're going to chew on something and swallow it into the stomach, it undergoes three phases. The first phase is the voluntary phase, what you're doing when you're chewing, all right? Mashing on the food, getting it ready, all right, to swallow it down. You start to form the bolus there. Your tongue's moving it around. Okay, and then you're going to move it back towards the posterior portion of the oral cavity, all right, towards the oral pharynx. That's the voluntary phase, okay? So if you put the food in your mouth, you're in this phase, okay? The pharyngeal phase, again, we're dealing with an involuntary reflex here, okay? So we're not, no longer going to be dealing with, all right, our ability to pretty much, have you ever tried to stop swallowing something when it's rolling down the back of your throat? It's very difficult to do that, by the way, okay? Very hard. That's why we, we're, we're dealing with an involuntary reflex here, okay? So here's what happens. As you start to swallow, you're going to stimulate the tactile, the touch receptors, all right, in those two arches, all right, the palatal pharyngeal arch and the palatal glossal arch, all right? And those receptors there are going to trigger the elevation of soft palate, all right, to move up, to block off, all right, the nasal pharynx, so nothing goes up that way, and it's also then going to cause the elevation of the larynx up towards the epiglottis, because the epiglottis will then, as the food and when the bolus is moving down, will close over, all right, the glottis to make sure that nothing goes down into your trachea. All this is stimulated by the swallowing center here. Okay, so let me go into detail about the, uh, what, this, what this all is, okay? The bolus starts to move into the oral pharynx, causes the elevation of the soft palate, okay, as it slides down the posterior portion of the oral pharynx, all right? That's when we get that elevation of the uh, voice box or larynx uh, up towards the epiglottis, and that closes down, the opening of the glottis there, okay? During this time, because we've actually elevated the epi, the, the larynx there, or excuse me, oh, I can't 
talk tonight. We've elevated, all right, the, the larynx or the laryngeal pharynx up, okay, and closed the epiglottis over, all right. Your respiratory centers are inhibited briefly so you're not taking a breath in, all right. It's practically impossible to take a breath in while you're swallowing something, okay, because one, the epiglottis is covering over the glottis there. As that occurs, all right, we start to move that food down the posterior portion of the laryngeal pharynx there, and it enters into the esophagus. Well, what happens then is that we cause relaxation of the superior esophageal sphincter, all right, allowing that food to move into the esophagus and down through the esophagus through a series of contractions and relaxations of the muscles in the esophageal passageway there, lumen, I should say. All right, so again, we'll contract behind the bolus that will push the bolus down inferior and relax the muscles in front of the bolus so it can slide down, traveling through the diaphragm, and then we have relaxation of the inferior esophageal sphincter, which will then push that bolus into the stomach. Now, once that's all done, all right, then those sphincters will close. So as soon as, as long as there's no more food that needs to be swallowed, all right, from your oral cavity, the first sphincter that will close up will be the superior esophageal sphincter, okay? Even though you might have food in the esophagus, okay? And then once that's cleared out, the inferior esophageal sphincter will, will, will contract and close, okay? Keep in mind, we want to prevent the reflux of any of those materials there. So that's what this picture is showing us here. Last slide, last slide. Okay, so here's our voluntary phase. We're forming our bolus here. Okay, we're starting to move that food product down towards the, or, the uh, oral pharynx here. Okay, as it's moving into this area, we transition into the uh, pharyngeal phase, the involuntary phase, where the soft palate elevates up. It blocks off the nasal pharynx. All right, the bolus now starts to move down, pushes, all right, the epiglottis over the glottis, but at the same time, we see an elevation here, all right, of the laryngeal pharynx, all right, lifting up, all right, to help meet the epiglottis to close that area off there, okay? And then the um, bolus starts to slide down posteriorly towards the esophagus, which brings us into the esophageal phase, all right? The superior esophageal sphincter will then well, superior esophageal sphincter will then relax, allows the bolus to enter in, okay? As all the food product has moved and left the oral cavity and the pharynx, then the superior esophageal sphincter will close, all right? Then we'll get, all right, those contractions in the esophagus pushing the food bolus down here into the stomach, all right? Prior to it entering the stomach, the inferior esophageal sphincter has to relax and open up. Once all the food has left the esophagus, then it contracts, and food enters into the stomach and lives there, and it becomes something else. But we'll talk about that on, what's today, Wednesday? Monday. We'll talk about it. You know, we got, tomorrow's our last week before spring break, right? Okay. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So let's take a break. I know a lot of that was review, but just a little bit more detail, and I hope it made a little bit more sense.